Great. Thanks very much, Bill. Uh, and once again, uh, we want to thank everyone for uh, joining us on this session. This is the fourth of five covering overlays. Today we're going to be talking about the construction phase, the plans, the maintenance of traffic and construction. Uh, just a reminder of the sponsors are the organizations that help fund the CP Tech Center. And I've added in this week uh, the logo for the National Concrete Consortium and the pooled fund that funds that consortium because uh, they have helped to uh, cover the costs for Gary's time. So as uh, Bill has already indicated, Gary and Brent are going to be doing the bulk of the of the talking. Feel free to type questions in the questions box. We will be emailing out responses to those questions uh, during the week. Uh, next week, we will be discussing uh, maintenance and repairs for overlays, and then we'll be wrapping up this five uh, session series. But do not despair, we will have um, two more sessions coming up. Uh, one of them, the, the next two sessions planned for May the 12th and May the 19th are going to be addressing ADA topics, understanding, planning, implementing ADA guidance. Uh, the, and the bulk of that work is going to be presented by Jesse Jonas. Uh, and I believe that uh, the presentations that he has for that are, are very good. The other thing we do want to emphasize is uh, thinking about where do we go next with this series? We've been stunned by the, uh, the reaction and uh, the number of people that have been signing on for this uh, set. I think a large part of it is because we're trapped at home. What's going to happen when we're free to go about our business? I don't know. But it is good for us to think about what do you need next? There is a survey out there. It has been emailed to everybody that has attended in the past. Uh, and we'll probably send out the link uh, to everybody that's on today. But feel free to think about you know, what would you like to hear about uh, which will help us make decisions on where do we go after we finish the two ADA topics. And with that, I think I am done. I will hand it back to, oh, okay, just the learning objectives. We have to do this for some states. Uh, you can read them on the screen there that uh, the things that you'll be learning through uh, today's webinar. And with that, I'm done. Um, Bill, you can hand it over to Gary and uh, have fun. Greetings, everybody. Uh, I hope you're staying uh, healthy and safe. We're going to cover a lot of ground today, and it's it's really going to be a 30,000 foot view. Um, we could spend a couple days going through all the details about uh, concrete overlay plans, maintenance of traffic, and construction. So, what I, with that in mind, since since we're um, really taking a, a high level view, I would encourage you one to take advantage of all the resources available at the CP Tech Center. Their website's easy to navigate. Uh, you'll find a lot of concrete overlay re resources there. I'd encourage you to um, talk to your neighbors, whether that's the, the state that adjoins you or the city or county that adjoins you and find out if they have any uh, concrete overlay experience that they'd, they'd be willing to share. And as well, the, uh, the local representatives of your um, uh, concrete Paving Association. Those, those are all excellent resources to get into the details. Again, we're going to kind of hit the uh, the highlights today. So, we start to develop a, a set of plans for concrete overlays. And, and if you're new to concrete overlays, um, I guess the, the simplest advice is uh, approach it like you would an asphalt overlay. Now, if it's a, uh, say, a, a county road, low volume road, uh, it doesn't require uh, 100 set, uh, 100 plan sheets in that set. Um, that's, that's a solution looking for a problem. We only need to address what needs to be uh, built by the contractor, uh, the information there. Again, and asphalt overlay set of plans that's, that's been recently constructed is a good uh, reference to start from. If you've got a uh, 
if your overlay project happens to be an urban freeway where we're utilizing, a, say, an unbonded overlay on an existing pavement, uh, that's a different animal. I mean, the geometrics, the maintenance of traffic, all that level of design is, is going to be more detailed than, say, a county road. Uh, I think Brent's going to show us a couple examples later on uh, after I'm done talking, but uh, just good rule of thumb. Um, keep it brief. Only include the information that uh, is needed to construct the project. Don't overthink it. So learning objectives of, of today, we're going to uh, hopefully identify some typical vertical constraints that require some design solutions to mitigate those. How we uh, balance maintenance of traffic and its impact on construction cost and schedule, there'll be a short discussion on that. Understanding uh, how we might reduce the width of the construction zone, what uh, what's required for concrete overlays as far as um, you know, encroachment on the actual roadway for the construction equipment. And then identification of key inspection items related to concrete paving of overlays. Well, the good news is uh, the CP Tech Center just recently published, I think it was 2019, uh, this guide for development concrete overlay and construction documents. Dale Harrington and, and Jared Gross just did an outstanding job on putting this together. So you can go to the CP Tech Center, download this document, and it really does just walk you through this step-by-step -step process of developing the project, sample construction drawings, references to a guide spec, which can apply to whatever type of overlay you're constructing, a discussion of cost, initial cost, and then uh, design lessons learned, right? Um, I think I've been involved in over 100 of these concrete overlays in the 30 years I've been doing this, and I've made my share of mistakes. So, and happy to admit that I've made mistakes. I think if, if we take the approach that um, we're not gonna try anything new, we're not gonna make any mistakes, uh, we're going backwards. So we should never be fearful of that, but we need to have every bit of information available to us that helps us to avoid those most mistakes and uh, lessons learned are, are valuable. So from that document, uh, you're just talking about, you get uh, really a, a full plan set with commentary so you'll see from you know title sheet typical section survey information all the way through with commentary what would apply to a concrete overlay for a set of plans there's also comprehensive detailed drawings that cover i, I think probably almost any situation you're going to encounter on a project whether it's you know transitions at the end of a project transitions into a structure uh, how we interface with existing features like curb and gutter, that type of thing. All those those detailed drawings are in there. Now there are certain things that we need to pay probably closer attention to in an overlay situation. Um, let's just call these constraints. They're not deal breakers, but we need to design around them to mitigate their impacts. So. You know, Google Earth is a place to start, but uh, we need boots on the ground at some point. Somebody's got to go out and, and actually physically look at this project, quantify the existing structures, um, bridges, overpasses, check overhead clearances, know what barrier rail is there, the quantity of it, uh, whether it needs to be replaced, whether it can stay in place. We need to have some idea about existing cross slope variability and new cross slope requirements. And uh, I will tell you that is a lesson learned. Um, certainly need to understand that if, if we've got an old crown two lane roadway that's that's got a curve in it that's never been super elevated and we desire to super elevate that curve, something needs to be done in the design to account for that. Or we're gonna end up with four inch thick concrete on the low side and 12 inch thick concrete on the high side of the super elevation, which may be the solution, but we need to know that as we're developing the design. We need to know what draining structures are there. If we're gonna to need to extend box culverts, extend crossroad pipes, because we're raising profile elevation and four slopes need to be regraded. We need to know what the, the kind of general condition of those four slopes is with regard to uh, safety runoff, and then how we interface with intersections, driveways, field entrances, whatever it might be. Again, these none of them are deal breakers, but uh, we need to go in with eyes wide open 
and design around them. Maintenance of traffic, um, I think best advice is don't get overwhelmed, all right? It is no more challenging than any other paving project um, as long as we use some, some standard practices, use common sense, and uh, if needed, think outside the box, okay? Do not be overwhelmed by maintenance of traffic. Hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate that a little bit uh, in, a, in a few of the oncoming slides. But in big picture, uh, I think we need to recognize that traffic strategies and, and how we maintain the traffic have a significant impact on cost. Um, my opinion, I think we need to step back, um, swing the pendulum back towards balancing construction cost against impact to the public. Um, like I said, I've been doing this for 30 years and road user cost came around say 15, 20 years ago and, and we swung the pendulum all the way one way. Um, I think that uh, there are certainly certain agencies that I've worked with across the US that uh, have looked at even really complex projects and said, you know what, we're better off closing this roadway, minimizing the closure time, get in, get out, stay out. So again, we need to recognize or associated with you know, maintaining traffic through a project. And I, I'm not saying that every project should be closed to the traffic. Uh, we just need to be smart about uh, how we maintain the traffic. There have been so many examples of urban intersections that have been uh, concurrently utilizing only weekend work hours. So it's it's going to be a two weekend project where we're overlaying opposite quadrants on one weekend. Weekend fill in the two other opposite quadrants, uh, minimizing uh, impact on on you know downtown urban business districts. And I think. What we need to do is define the criteria, right? Where we've decided what this maintenance traffic needs to look like. Is it keeping two lanes open at all times? Is it, you know, nighttime closures? Whatever your criteria is, state it clearly in the contract and let the contractor propose staging criteria. So, uh, to kind of take a look at. Our, uh, and, Gary, and this may sorry. oversimplify things, but I think it's a place to start. Sorry, Gary, Bill, what's sorry up? Sorry to interrupt you. Um, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we're having uh, some uh, audio issues, and uh, the participants aren't able to hear or understand what you're saying because the this, this signal is broken, uh, breaking up, rather. Uh, could you switch over to the phone option? Yeah, let me. We apologize for this. Again, this is uh, kind of a function of the uh, high usage of uh, uh, presentation platforms such as that we're using and also uh, the internet these days. So, symptomatic of uh, what we're all living with. And here he's switching over. Over to a telephone option for this and hope to uh, proceed in just a moment or two. Can you hear me, Bill? Yeah, so it's Sounds like we're in good shape, and so Gary, I'll let you just take it away. You may want to back up a, a slide or two and just cover um, uh, what was in the previous slide again, if you'd like. Yeah, let me, uh, okay, let me just kind of recap here. Previous slide and, and um, summarize that. I apologize for, for any technical difficulties, and don't guarantee this solution will work either, because my, my office phone is, is VoIP as well, so we'll see what happens. So traffic strategies, we all need to recognize that um, it does affect the cost of the project, right? Um, and we just probably need to balance and, and take a close look at what we're doing to maintain traffic 
and how it, it how it impacts initial cost. Uh, a number of examples of where urban inter intersections been uh, overlaid with concrete, utilizing uh, only weekend work hours. So basically, a two weekend project to minimize the impact on on urban areas. And then uh, I guess overall, once you decide how you're going to whatever it is. Set that criteria and let the contractor propose staging that meets that criteria. So let's just kind of walk through and, and maybe oversimplify, but I hope not. Um, when I take a look at a concrete overlay project, I've um, been involved in a number of these for the CP Tech Center where we go out and support uh, an agent. And see in, in implementing concrete overlay. Uh, kind of the first thing I look at is if the edge drop off criteria is exceeded, okay, whatever that is for your agency, then the maintenance traffic, the sequence of construction is going to look very similar to full depth PCC reconstruction. Um, now it's not going to be as long. Every one of your scheduled durations is going to be much shorter from the paving uh, phase because it's an overlay if we have not it's similar to an asphalt overlay okay that's kind of the way I, I, I cut the, the pie right there if, if we just start with edge drop off criteria and let that drive how we maintain the traffic and there's a lot of options out there we can construct two lanes or four lanes adjacent to traffic which is lane at a time uh, we use pod positive separation or cones. We can use that pilot car in, in the two-lane roadway example. We can build crossovers and construct full width using contraflow for a divided highway scenario. Already talked about stage intersections. So there are a number of options available. And I just start cutting the, the pie there at looking at edge drop-off criteria. And just, I mean, don't forget all concrete overlays are accelerated construction. So let's walk through a real life example. This happens to be State Highway 18 up in Iowa. This is a two lane roadway constructed um, a thin, I think it was average, say five inch thick concrete overlay using pilot car operation. So we're maintaining two way traffic using pilot car operation. You can see where there, uh, the traffic's pushed over onto the, the granular shoulder just in the area around the paving train. So we're probably talking about you know, 500 foot where that traffic gets moved over, kind of straddling the edge of pavement and shoulder. What's that look like in a um, kind of a schematic? Let's let's walk through stage one of of a similar project. So stage one, we're going to implement the pilot car. Implement. Maybe that's widen the shoulder. Maybe it's strengthen the shoulder that's there. So that we can maintain traffic through the first phase of overlay construction. So once we've done those repairs, we're going to move this traffic over, utilize a pilot car, build the concrete overlay on, on this half of the two-lane roadway. Put the traffic back on the completed first half of concrete overlay build the second half. And that's that's what you were seeing in those photographs from the State Highway 18 project. We had traffic up on that first lane completed and constructing the second lane. Completed overlay looks like this. Um, and, and that approach has been used, gosh, uh, in, in at least three states that I know of where you know, it, it was very questionable. Can we do this? Can we build the concrete overlay using a pilot car approach? Uh, depending on the, the volume of traffic, kind of depends on what your construction elements look like, whether they're three miles long, four miles long, or five miles long, uh, that type of thing. So you can kind of back into what your acceptable queue uh, length of time is. When we're looking at, at concrete overlays and, and developing the plans and maintenance of traffic, we need to recognize uh, that equipment's going to encroach upon outside of the width of paving, 
uh, where we're trying to maintain traffic. So if you're just looking at this picture, you know, we've got edge of paving somewhere here. We've got string line that's offset from that. We've got string line pins and we've, we've got traffic control devices that are all, even beyond that. So we're probably six foot offset from edge of pavement into the construction zone. So as we're developing plans, looking at the design, talk, talking to industry, we need to define that allowable clearance zone. So we've got to, we've got to figure out how much room we need for traffic. Is an 11 foot lane gonna be okay? Uh, is a 10 foot lane gonna be okay? Are we gonna detour all wide loads? Whatever that is, we've gotta accommodate traffic control devices and their width, and then the construction equipment and the workers. So define, again, just like we kind of define maintenance of traffic criteria for a contractor to innovate with their equipment and processes to work within that zone. That's their area to work. A uh, couple adaptations, uh, solutions, Two, reducing the, the width that we need to con construct a concrete overlay. Uh, see kind of top of the screen, this is a moving string line. I mean, been around about as long as I have. Um, and then we have stringless paving. This is a, a 3D machine control device. Uh, again, no encumbrance outside of the width of the track and then whatever traffic control devices we need to protect the workers and the, the public. As I said, concrete overlays are accelerated construction. Um, I mean, we have never exposed that subgrade to, to uh, weather. So literally, unless it is snowing or raining, we can be paving. Production is typically production rate is going to be limited by our capacity to saw joints in a timely manner. And I'm going to show you a good example of that a little bit later. Uh, these types of jobs are, are very conducive to lane rental and A plus B uh, bidding with uh, incentives uh, because we, we've eliminated a lot of the weather risk. Uh, it's much easier for a contractor to put a pencil to what are my durations uh, um, and, and stick to it. And we should be using normal concrete mixtures. We do not need to use accelerated concrete mixtures. Um, I, again, in, in probably 90% of the projects that I've been involved with, which is a bunch of them, um, I rarely see cure time for the concrete on the critical path. I had miscellaneous work going on before we're switching traffic, whether that's shoulder up, temporary traffic control devices, temporary traffic signals, whatever that is, that's all going on while we're getting cure time. So uh, again, there are exceptions. Uh, certainly we've got gaps and leave outs where we want to consider using an accelerated mixture, but it, it should not be the norm. I'm going to transition now into uh, kind of going through the construction process. And uh, it is, except, you know, other than a project, okay? One of the differences, uh, we would, if we have an existing asphalt pavement, there are many times where we mill that existing pavement uh, for a number of reasons. We can re remove distortions of two inches or more, right? And, and that helps us get a more uniform thickness center concrete overlay, reduce high spots so that we make we ensure that we have a minimum overlay thickness. We may, may need to driveways, whatever it is. Um, milling can enhance bond on, on an existing asphalt pavement. Uh, probably the biggest reason, okay, we've got an existing pavement up there. We're trying to minimize the amount that we raise profile grade. Um, every time we raise profile grade we bring another one of those constraints that we talked about earlier into play so we're trying to minimize vertical grade changes and that's that's most commonly achieved through milling we can mill existing concrete as well we've, we've got to know where the steel is in that existing concrete and, and and pay attention to that and we can restore profiles just like i showed the uh the 3d paving the 
stringless paving application, there are 3D milling machines where we can profile mill an existing pavement to whatever cross section we desire. If you were in on uh, last week's um, webinar, uh, this is a key thing that we need to understand when we're milling an existing pavement. If we're going to bond on an existing asphalt or composite pavement, we have to maintain a minimum of three inches of sound asphalt after milling. Okay, okay. key point there. So this is kind of what it looks like uh, post milling. Top left, or let's start top right. We're sweeping, we're cleaning uh, out ahead of the paver. Then top left, we're we're kind of blowing the rest of the dust dust off of this milled surface with compressed air, what you see in the middle bottom on an overlay. So that, that non-woven GX textile is rolled out, glued down, and uh, paved over as a separation layer. Some pre-paving activities. Uh, one way or another, we've got to tell that paver where to go and what elevation to stay at. Uh, that's uh, historically been string line, but um, more and more over the last 10 years and, and increasingly now uh, it's stringless control for a slip form paver. And that's kind of what you see in this picture. This is a robotic uh, total station control telling that paver where it's at X, Y, Z, and uh, then it's, uh, it's following a model to stay on grade and alignment. Whichever we're doing, whether it's stringless or 3D, we need to optimize our profiles for thickness, volume, and smoothness. Um, my definition for optimized is the best compromise, okay? So we, we need to recognize that if we're going to desire a certain thickness, a certain smoothness, we may end up with additional volume of concrete. Um, not addressed here more detail, but it's, it's very common for these projects to be bid on a square yard basis for labor and installation and on a cubic yard basis for material because we recognize we're going to have some variable thickness and we're trying to find that best compromise or optimization of our profile. We typically wet the surface and that's uh, that, that's full depth pavement or an overlay. I think maybe the only exception would be uh, we want to be careful if we're bonded on an existing concrete, but uh, we're looking to dampen that surface that we're placing our overlay on. We want to distribute the concrete evenly out ahead of the paving operation, avoid segregation. So if, if we start to get segregated mixture, that's going to affect our permeability, our strength, our shrinkage properties. Uh, in, in essence, it's going to not be good news for durability of that pavement. So the objective is to provide us a, a continuous supply of concrete to that paper. Ideally, we want it to, to move at the same rate without stops all day, all night, whatever it is. Uh, if we can maintain a consistent head in the grout box of that paper, uh, that's going to contribute to improved smoothness. little kind of follow up on on head so what we're talking about is the material that's in the grout box of the paver so if we've got too little head on the left um, we run the potential of starving that, that paver for concrete we end up could end up with some durability issues but more than likely more just uh, a dip in the pavement if we've overloaded the paver we're, we're most certainly going to have some localized roughness in those areas. So again, it's, it's we want to maintain uniform supply, uniform head in the grout box. So you're going to see a few of these slides, kind of key inspection items throughout uh, what I've got here for construction process. But we want to make sure that uh, as we inspect, that's everybody's job. Okay, uh, I, my first 15 years and in the road building industry was with a contractor and and I used to preach to the folks that I worked with that um, they were inspectors as well and and part of their job was to inspect and correct and not give uh, that inspector an excuse to get out of the pickup truck okay we're we should be looking at everything we're producing and correcting on the fly 
uh, it's everybody's job. So this is not just agency uh, consultant related as far as inspection goes. So we ought to be looking and making sure we're, we're properly wetted out front. We're, we're kind of inspecting this, this pile of concrete out in front of the paver to make sure we don't have any segregation, that we don't see you know, improperly mixed where we've got sand streaks or we're seeing clay balls or anything like that. And then uh, probably note times or locations where we've got head at extremes, okay? At, at the most, we, or at the least, we can come back and correlate those locations to profile measurements or other quality measurements. Slip form paver. Uh, the function is really to consolidate shape and provide initial finish to that uh, that concrete whatever pavement smoothness you get is is highly influenced by the paver and its operation uh, there are improvements you can make the smoothness with hand finishing um, we don't have time to go into that this hour but uh, perhaps uh, some other time so if you're not using a, uh, a vibrator monitor which you see on the left uh, you should at a minimum, uh, verify that those vibrators are operational every day before production starts. Okay, Th that those vibrators on the right are doing the bulk of the work in consolidating and moving that mixture through uh, the paver mold. If we over vibrate, okay, we see vibrator trails, and that's what you see on the right. On the left, you can see in that core where that vibrator left a huge void of hardly any coarse aggregate particles, okay? We've just got a big mass of mortar and paste within that slab. Uh, the, some of the worst cases I've seen of vibrator trails, you'll end up developing longitudinal cracks in, in many of these trails, okay? Under vibration is going to look like poor consolidation, okay? We, we, in, the best way to note that is with a core. Kind of the guts of a concrete paver, we see the vibrators up front, we see the uh, extrusion pan that needs to be checked that it's true to cross slope and whatever crown is there. Uh, there's overbuild, whatever we want to call it, we should have neat edges at the sides of the, the paver. So we talked about maintaining that consistent speed. That's the ideal. Uh, we don't live in an ideal world. So uh, kind of scenario you see in this picture is the paver is caught up to the spreader. Okay, should he slow down or should he stop? I mean, there's you, there's no truck at the spreader. Maybe there's one backing down that's uh, a minute away. And uh, I think what needs to be done is his contractor needs to verify with uh, his profile information whether it's whether it's better to slow down or stop. But I, I think I, uh, after the last 10 years of, of following these pavers around with real-time smoothness, smoothness devices, pretty confident in saying we're better off stopping. We don't want to be stopping every 15 feet. We need to adjust our uniform speed so that we're not stopping every 15 feet. But uh, Stopping is preferable over slowing down. Uh, when we slow down, vibrator speed is, is sensitive to, to paver speed. We really don't know how much to affect or adjust vibrator frequency uh, when we start to slow down. Hand finishing happens uh, in almost all cases on a slip form paving job. Uh, those finishers are doing a number of things. But if you can see in this photo, one is identifying bumps and dips. So you can see that he's cutting a bump here with that straight edge. Uh, that straight edge needs to be advanced kind of half the length of the straight edge. We need to correct those bumps and dips, fill surface voids, and avoid over finishing. What should we be looking for? Uh, pavement edge. Uh, is it straight? Is it true? Um, I would prefer to have some surface voids over slurry running off the edge. That slurry running off the edge is uh, could be mixture related, could be over finishing. Either way, I'm not a big fan. Okay, content. We're more susceptible to shrinkage, early cracking, um, just not ideal. 
So what do we do during the day of paving? What can we adjust? What should we adjust? We need to adjust vibrator frequency to make sure that we have proper consolidation and we're not over vibrating. Carefully adjust paver speed so that we minimize stops. Refine the mixture proportions. Okay, if, if, if we've got a mix that just is not behaving, um, if our edge is falling day after day, hour after hour, it, it's time to adjust the mix. Texturing. So if we keep walking back through the paving drain, the next thing we're going to find is, is texture. Uh, micro texture is usually uh, part of a drag, whether it's a burlap drag, it could be a, an astroturf or, or a carpet drag. And then macro, macro texture is tiny. Curing, um, you know, we heard from uh, Dr. Taylor at the beginning of this, and uh, especially. Um, even much more important on thin overlay sections. When we start to get six inches or thinner, we've, we've really changed the uh, surface area to volume ratio. So we've got to be very careful about our curing. Like uh, the, if I just hit the highlights, it's you need to cure before you have any surface evaporation and you need to have complete coverage, all right? It needs to look like a white sheet of paper. What do we do uh, with respect to, to texture and cure for appropriate actions? We need to keep those those uh, tines on the rake clean and straight. We shouldn't delay curing operations because we're waiting for texture to be perfect. I mean, if, if we're risking some surface evaporation because we want to see a, a perfectly tined surface, uh, we're, we're kind of uh, stepping on our own toes. We, we need to get it cured before any surface evaporation occurs. Adjust those curing operations for dry or windy or wet, whatever windy weather conditions we have. Clean and adjust those. If our cure job looks like the one on the left, uh, just it's not acceptable. Okay? If, I, if I hire somebody to come paint my house, I expect to, to see it fully covered, not streaked like that. Uh, and I think it's the same approach we need to take with with curing. We need a complete coverage of cure. We want to see uniform texture, but not at the expense of timing of the curing compound. So concrete overlays, uh, especially when we get down to uh, six inches or less, we start to have smaller slab sizes. If you're on last week's uh, webinar, I'm sure we talked about uh, smaller slab sizes. So we're, we're usually seeing Increased quantity of saw cuts for thinner overlays. That has uh, some impact, right? We need to, we'll talk about that. Longitudinal cuts are just as critical as transverse saw cuts. We've got increased base friction, especially in a bonded situation. We've got base movement issues. We've got an old base diurnally, probably. We've got to maintain or address whatever temperature that existing pavement is that we're, we're placing our overlay on and then control our mix temperature, all right? We, we should have minimum, maximum mix temperatures, stay within those specified zones and, and uh, adjust as we need to. Specify the saw cut depth, um, require that uh, the contractor have an adequate number of saws and blades. So just an example here, uh, if we've got a typical job, contractor's normal paving day is 2,500 cubic yards, all right? If that pavement's 10 foot, 10 inches thick, we're 24 foot wide, we've got slab dimensions of 12 foot by 15 foot. His saw crew needs to do about 9,000 lineal foot of saw cut to cover that day. That same 2,500 cubic yard day, if we're six inches thick, with six foot by six foot slabs, we're now doing 40,000 lineal foot of saw cut. So I think you remember earlier in, in the presentation that said our, our production rate sometimes needs to be controlled by the quantity that we can saw in a day. Fairly good example. If, if we can saw 40,000 foot a day, we should be shooting for 2,500 cubic yards a day. If, if we're not capable of that, we need to back off production rate. When's the best time 
of the saw. Uh, I wish I had that answer. I'd be very rich. Um, the best answer I have is before it cracks. I, I you know, we, we have this concept called the sawing window. It's not hypothetical. It's real, but it's undefined and it moves on us every day. So we need to be aware of that. Um, we do not have the technology today to predict the exact time to start saw cutting. It, it's still art with um, science. And so whether that art is a lucky coin that that, that saw form and scratches the, the surface with and says it's time to saw, whatever it is, but we in moderate raveling. Um, I think C is way too early. But it's one of those things that I, I think, you know, Dr. Taylor and I have talked a lot about this. I think we're on the verge of, of having some technology tools that are going to be very helpful in defining, better defining that sawing window and uh, helping our our cause there. So key inspection items, are we sawing to the specified depth and width? Do we have the appropriate saw blades? Do we have enough saw blades on hand and sawing equipment? There are still other things beyond our control. Uh, the weather changes on us every day. In fact, I'm, I'm sitting here waiting for uh, some uh, baseball size hail to show up at my house in a couple hours, so be able to adjust for that. But if you're paving today in, in Oklahoma, maybe now it's time uh, to shut down and uh, make sure we've got some set time on that slab before it gets hailed on. But we need to be able to adjust daily to weather conditions and understand uh, what those impacts are. I'm going to turn it over now to Brent to go over some examples from Oklahoma. Thanks, Gary. Uh, just waiting for my screen to come up. Bear with me for a moment. There we go. Uh, I've got a couple of things I want to go over today. I wanted to review uh, some simple plans uh, sets that we've made up here in Oklahoma. And then when we get done with that, I've got a few projects to go over with you uh, that we've done here. It's always good to see what other people around the country are doing as far as their overlays. First, we'll, we'll take a look at the plan sets. You know, uh, 20 some odd years ago, when I, uh, you know, first started getting involved in concrete overlays, if you mentioned the word overlay, it was just assumed that you were talking about asphalt overlays. In fact, we had here locally, we had money set aside every summer to do do uh, just that. All right, we call it our overlay program. I think other uh, states probably had the same thing. And uh, with that, these were you know pretty simple jobs. You just start here, in there, make it this thick and this wide. And uh, typically, these plan sets for those types of overlays were just done out in the field division or field district, whichever you call it. And so when we started doing the concrete overlays, we said, well, why can't we take that same concept and apply them to concrete overlays? And we did. And uh, if I can get this slides to dance. Here's just a sample of one of them that we did. I think this one has like seven sheets on it. Of course, you start out with the title page, uh, got your project number, a description, what county it's in, uh, the uh, project number assigned from the office division, we send it there. But again, these uh, plans were just developed right out in the field division by usually the maintenance engineer. And, uh, you know, uh, pretty quick turnaround once you got them in, send them to office vision, they'd get them let, and we'd get them out to construction. So the turnaround was pretty quick. Now, like Gary said in the beginning, not all of these, in uh, the beginning of his presentation, not all your overlay projects are going to be uh, ones you want to use a simplified set of plans like this. If you're in urban sections or, you know, you've got a lot of grade issues to deal with, a lot of elevations that you need to match. Uh, if you had right away to buy or utilities, you probably wouldn't want to do this. But, you know, if you're out in a rural area, like a lot of our projects have been, you got open uh, shoulder sections, then it's pretty, uh, works pretty well. In fact, talk to a lot of contractors that really like them because, you know, there's not a lot uh, um, 
a debate on it. It's pretty simple what the state wants. You go in, start here, in there, make it this thick and that wide, and it makes life pretty simple. So you can see on this uh, set of plans, uh, after we got through with the title sheet, we came up with the uh, typical section. I apologize, I'm sure you can't read this on your screen. It's pretty small writing, but we have a stabilized subgrade that was built in the previous project here and a 10 inches of hot mix that was existing. We're showing a seven inch dowel jointed PC is gonna be overlaid on it. We've got the width uh, dimensions on here. And then of course, uh, there's some extra details can be placed in here. You know, some details on the crossover detour, also uh, the transition section at uh, beginning end of project. And then some plan notes over here, like how are we going to back, what are we going to use to backfill, uh, you know, uh, dowel bar diameter, things like that. Got in here. So just on this particular project, the engineer had a meeting, median opening that he had to deal with. So he thought he'd put a detail in there on showing how he wanted the contractor address that. So he's got this detail in there. And then we get to the pay item list. Um, Pretty simple, you know. Uh, this one I think has 16 pay items. It's got uh, uh, lump sum traffic control, which on most of the overlays you can do. However, I have been involved with a couple of projects where we did a more robust traffic control uh, setup, but usually on something small like this, you can just get away with a lump sum traffic control item. Uh, more plan quantity notes. Uh, Construction and traffic notes, if you need those, you know, these are for any, you know, extra things you need to point out. Most of everything on these projects is going to be covered in the standard specifications or on standard drawings. So you can also refer to those if you have some applicable standards that you need to include with this, you can list them uh, in this set of plans too. So, really, that's all there is to it. It's pretty simple. I mean, it, like I said in the beginning, it's just based on, uh, you know, what we used to do with asphalt overlays. You begin your project here, end it here. We're going to make it this wide. You might want to consider a set of plans. With that, I'm going to move into some projects that uh, we have done in Oklahoma, just to give you an idea. And I'll try to remember as we go along here and tell you which ones were uh, conventional type of plan sets and which ones we did with the uh, simplified plan set. So this is a, uh, a road out in Kingfisher County. It's kind of a little bit northwest of Oklahoma City. If you're uh, familiar with Oklahoma, Oklahoma City is right in the center of the state. It was just your typical county road over the years. You know, it probably started out as a, uh, you know, just a uh, gravel road, agri-based road. Had some layers of chip seal and hot mix over the, over the years. Uh, the engineer wanted to widen it, and so we widened with aggregate base and then placed a five inch unbonded concrete overlay on it. And what's kind of unique about this project or interesting about this project, it was an alternate bid, and it was a straight up five inches of hot mix versus five inches of concrete. Uh, there was no uh, adjustment factor on it or anything, and obviously concrete, uh, the uh, concrete option did win. One thing I did have concerns about with this project, and it was constructed, I did, I'm sorry I didn't put the uh, date on here, I think we built this in 2008, 2007 or 2008, and um, where we widened, if you can see where I'm pointing here, this longitudinal joint concerned me a little bit that you have maybe differential settlement there or differential support, and um, so we we still we paved right over it. I don't think we put any reinforcing steel there. I think Iowa and some other states have laid a, a tie bar along these joints like this. I can't remember for sure because it's been over a decade ago since we built this one, but I don't think it uh, had any uh, reinforcing steel. I go out there at least once a year and this is what it looks like finished. I have yet to see uh, any type of crack develop along that longitudinal joint. So looks like uh, either contractor did a pretty good job on compacting his base there. Uh, next, we've got a project in uh, Cimarron County. Cimarron County is in the panhandle of Oklahoma. And if you were on last week's webinar, 
and heard Angela talk about Colorado, some things they did. They did a lot of overlays to the north on US 287. It's a two lane facility across Oklahoma. And like she said, it's a lot of trucks. You know, we've only got 6,500 ADT, but 60% trucks. I mean, that's a lot of trucks. Uh, the engineer here decided to go with an unbonded concrete overlay on asphalt. And uh, uh, as you can see, we built this under traffic. Now you can see the dowel baskets have been cut in half. The ones over towards the center line are already nailed down. Uh, this guy back in here, you can if, I don't know if you can see it or not, but he's holding a Hilti nailer. So when the truck gets out of the way, he'll drag the next basket over, place it in the right spot, and he'll nail it down right quick. And then the next truck can back up it and, and uh, dump and pave over it. Just let you know what's going on there. Built this in 2007 and. Uh, Looks like uh, this today, and it's in you know great shape, doing very well. They've got plans. There's we still have a little sec, uh, a little bit to go to get it paved all the way to Colorado, uh, but I think uh, the next two sections are in the eight-year plan, and we should be getting to those shortly. Uh, next, we've got a project uh, Southeast 15th Street in Dell City. I wish I had more time to talk to you about this one. A very interesting project. Um, after one of our workshops, an engineer came up to me and said, hey, I got a prototype I want to do something with. And we went out and took a look at it. As you can see, uh, it, this thing had an overlay on it. This was an existing seven inch uh, plain jointed concrete pavement, had an uh, overlay on it in the past. It's got patches on top of patches. We can't see the existing concrete. And you know, it, it was not a candidate for a bonded concrete overlay on concrete in my mind. But and I told the engineer that, and he was not satisfied with what he'd been doing in the past, which is just asphalt overlays. We want to try something different, so he stepped out, and we did this anyway. Long and short of it is, we um, removed the asphalt overlay, did some full depth patching where it was needed. Probably should have done a little bit more, but I think we got the major stuff. Uh, stitched some longitudinal cracks. Now I'm stitching. Uh, if they were working cracks, we remove the panels and would replace them. I'm not, I don't really remember if we, any of them were working because most of it was stitched. If they're not working, in other words, the elevations of the two sides of the crack are the same, then we just stitched them up. Placed a three inch bonded concrete overlay on it. Now this was constructed in 2006 and that's what it turned out to look like. It's uh, been functioning very well. There are the only problems I've seen on some of the street returns where there are valley gutters and the trucks are coming in and kind of getting a little impact load on it have broken up a little bit. I think that's something if we did this project over, we might do a little more full depth patching in those areas and be a little bit more diligent in how we laid that out. So that was a very interesting project it's functioning very well right now. And then we have. Um, US 59, Sequoia County. Now this project is one that we did with the simplified plan set that I spoke about earlier. Uh, this was a, a, a newer hot mix uh, section that had some problems and the engineer needed a quick fix. So we got together and came up with a, dis, a thickness design and he just put these together on a, a, the plan sets that you saw. It had about seven sheets in it, 16 pay items. And for some reason, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, that's what it, let's see. Yeah, that's what it looked like to begin with. And then this is what it looks like now. I guess I advanced the slide a little too quick. Anyway, that project is performing great. Uh, from start to finish, it took very little time. From the time he decided, hey, I need to overlay this to the time they got out there and did the construction. I don't remember the exact time, but it, I do remember it going very quickly. Yeah. And then lastly, US 69 in Pittsburgh County. This one for me is kind of the acid test of overlays. This is what really sold me on them forever. Uh, this one was built in 2001, September of 2001. It was designed by the field division. Again, this was done on a simplified plan sheet, a set of plans. The inside lane is four inches thick. The outside lane is six, six inches thick. Now, we've got, if you'll skip down in my bullet points a little bit, so far, we've taken about 20, in my estimation, about 25 million easels. When you think about that, um, the conventional wisdom is on a rural or semi-rural area like this is four-lane facility, 
about 20% of the truck traffic is in the passing lane. So about 20% of those 25 million easels have gone on a four inch thick pavement. I think that's pretty awesome. You can see the shape the pavement was in before. It was a full depth uh, asphalt section on a pretty fat clay. And there was a lot of uh, rutting and shoving in it. In fact, on the, uh, the hump there in the middle, you can see the grind marks. We took a motor patrol with uh, serrated tooth blades and had to shave those humps down because it had rutted so much it pushed it up in the middle and they were getting some complaints from uh, drivers of small vehicles that were bottoming out their cars there. You actually see over closer to the, the uh, center line where the uh, two passes of the top lift had kind of separated and it was pulling apart. It's really rough shape. Anyway, went down there, built it under traffic and uh, we took the millings. Now, you know, we got four inches on the inside lane, six inches the out, outside lane. The way we did that was just differential depth milling. So we, you know, milled the outside lane two inches deeper than the inside lane. Then took those millings and kind of built a little shoe fly out there and detoured the truck traffic, pushed them over just enough so we'd have room to pave that outside lane before we switched them back. Like I said, we built that in 2001, so it was in September, so we're just a few months away from that being 19 years old, and that's what it looks like today, uh, performing very well. Overall in Oklahoma, we've got at least 60 overlays, and we've got all types from bonded concrete on concrete to unbonded on asphalt and everything in between, and I've had very good success with them. So I think, that takes up all my time. We're about one minute over on my clock. Sorry about that, Gary. Bill, I think I'm uh, done, so I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks very much, Brent and Gary. I really appreciate uh, all the expertise that you've provided us here. Uh, there have been some technical questions coming in, so we'll be compiling those and getting them out to you and inviting you to uh, provide some answers. Again, apologies uh, to everybody that attended for the, the issues of the sound. It's one of those things we don't have a lot of control over. Uh, so PDH certificates, answers to questions will be going out by email later in the week. Uh, you do need to register if you're going to sign on for the fifth and final version of the overlay. And again, just to remind everyone that uh, there is a survey out there. Um, on what we should be covering next. And with that, I will thank everyone for attending, all 725 of you, and look forward to seeing you all next week.